It goes without saying that conversations about transforming institutions of higher learning have taken center stage, especially here at the university currently known as Rhodes University. Um, the Black Student Movement has brought about necessary disruption in a university that requires, um, with an institutional culture that requires a deep interrogation. Um, the Black Student Movement also occupied the council chambers and had, the, and had it renamed the Black Student Movement Commons. Um, today, for our final webcast, we are joined by Professor Lewis Gordon, one of the greatest thinkers on political thought. His recent book, What Fanon Said, a philosophical introduction to his life and thought, came out recently. We're also joined by Sikona, a member of the Black Student Movement, um, to further talk about transformation at this university. Um, thank you for joining us. Okay. Uh, Pleasure to be here. Okay, so maybe Sikona, if I can just start with you, um, in terms of the occupation that lasted a few weeks, a bit longer than it was supposed to. Maybe mm -hmm. if we can just reflect on what the demands the movement were making and how, how to what extent they were met by the university. Um, the BSM had put a lot of demands for the university in trying to push decolonization in this institution. And among the issues that come is um, the fact that a lot of marginalized, there are a lot of marginalized students and um, these are, inclu this includes um, poor students. So VAC accommodation affects these people and therefore we were trying to push VAC accommodation because um, the university demands people to leave during short VAC and if they do not leave they have to pay. Therefore, the, as the black student movement we were trying to um, ask the university to meet the, the demands that that com accommodation should be provided for these students. So that was what the occupation was about. Okay, for people who might not maybe enter the conversation of students staying at res and understanding how that fits in within decolonizing the university, um, how do you think that features into decolonizing the university, the issue of back accommodation? Um, the issue of VAC accommodation, like I said, pertains to the fact that it excludes, it's very classist in that it excludes poor students who come from a poor background because they cannot afford to leave for VAC. And so we need to understand that there are socioeconomic um, issues that will affect students that come to this institution, and this is Africa, this is South Africa, so the university needs to take that into account and therefore in decolonizing that they would include those students that are marginalized. And, and to what extent has the university responded? As can students now, can we expect students over the coming vacations to stay in the university um, as it stands or is that still being discussed? Um, we, during the occupation we have, we have been having um, conversations with management and um, we organize a task team in, um, to attain to this issue and we have drafted a proposal with the, t the task team and the Senate approved and therefore they, are, they, they need to push this further so I, um, in my understanding um, the issue of vacuum commutation is still being solved but we have um, pushed it further. Okay. Um, and leaving of the Okay. Um, Prof, if I can just bring you in here as well, um, because in your book, um, you draw on Fanon in saying that black people want to be human in a structure that denies their humanity. Um, and I think we're seeing here that students have been saying we want to decolonize university in many ways. Um, what does it mean for you to begin to decolonize universities? Well, thank you for the question. Thank you, my. <laughs> we've, we've had such wonderful conversations, especially during the occupation. And one of the things I just want to just say, and I said it in a, a recent uh, discussion, that it's basically bravo, brava. It's congratulations. You see, every struggle that pushes you a little forward means another generation doesn't have to do that now. They can go further. And the idea is for all of us to create higher standards that on which others can actually reach 
and to, to articulate what it is that we've been struggling for all along. The question you ask uh, is interestingly enough connected to my uh, t-shirt. My uniforms oh, these days are t-shirts. Uh, so this one is danger, educated black man armed with knowledge. But of course the question is what kind of knowledge? Mm. By the way, there's an edu danger, educated black woman for anybody. Uh. Like it. It's gotten to a point where t-shirt companies are writing me, asking me to wear their t-shirts. And I have to explain, uh, echo and beco, I wear what I like. But to the, to the question, to the question you're asking, the, um, I think this struggle really illustrates the point very well. You see, uh, what people missed about what Fanon was saying is that, and it's something I've also argued in some of my other books, which is that we have to understand that colonization and racism are projects to try to make a group of people believe they're not really human beings. It doesn't follow that that project has been achieved. And why that project has not been achieved is because at every moment, the people on whom that was inflicted fought back. And what Fanon and many others try to remind us is that if we refuse to stand up for our humanity, then we become a slave to the very production of our inhumanity or dehumanization. I was speaking to a man in Kalicha who was saying, I'm not a human being, look how they treat me, blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, you know, if you were a human being, you wouldn't be so pissed off. That special form of assertion is what, is what it's about. And what Fanon said it was about being actional. And it's not only what he did in terms of the struggles he fought, the things he did in Algeria, the things he did in Martinique and in France, it's also Malcolm X, it's also Claudia Jones, it's also Anna Julia Cooper, it's also in this country everything from Biko, and yeah, people may diss her, but Winnie Mandela. All of these people, all the way through, and all across the country, and of course, there are those who always will buy into the system and undermine it. But the main thing is that this was an issue that these students came behind, and it was more, what, what's striking about it is, you see, they could have come to Rhodes simply for a certification in the form of mm -hmm. degrees. But you know, a degree is not an education. A degree, people, people as we know, even, you know, it was so easy to get a degree in apartheid South Africa if you're white. So there are a lot of other educated people with degrees. Education is, is growth. It's what, you, it, it's, it's, the certification gives you access, but education is more. And that's what these st students in their struggle did, because that education is also their assertion of their humanity. Thank you. If I can just um, draw back on that as well, because I think even on social networks, some people say to the black student movement and people who stand up um, for transformation to say, you know, um, you knew to you knew what hap what happens in these universities when you went there. You know, you knew the name was Rhodes. Why do you now want it to change? Um, and I think this is something that hasn't been really thoroughly responded to. So I'm not sure how we begin to think of being human in this space when you know people are saying these are systems that have been going on for so many years. Um, and you know it's almost as though people are expected to accept those kind of structures. So I'm not sure how. I would like you to respond first, if you don't mind. Um, I don't understand how people can like say you knew the name of Rhodes and yet you still chose to come here. Because I feel like I have the freedom to choose where I want to be educated. Mm -hmm. And just because um, racism occurs in a certain place does not, meet, does not make it right. Just because it had been occurring for a very, very long time yeah. does not make it right. So me coming here knowing doesn't mean I'm just gonna leave it. I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna question it and then we need to break down this system, systematic oppression that happens in this place. It's not like I'm going to come here and I'm going to let it, like just leave it. So that that is what BSM, I think, as a whole, what we try to do when we try to conscientize students to understand that we try to drive the transformation that happens in this university because it cannot stay the colonial place mm -hmm. that it is. Okay, so how have students responded to the um, BSM? Because uh, people probably say that BSM maybe might be aloof 
um, to students because some students, a lot of students at Rose are hostile to the project of transformation. Mm -hmm. So how have students responded to the project? Um, we have had a lot of students who have been um, invalidating our experiences as black students in this university. So when we tell the students that we feel alienated, um, we get questions like, how can you feel alienated when because of this road culture that exists, that tries to push this PS vibe, whatever. Um, and they have this whole thing that our blood is purple, so when you do speak out, mm -hmm. um, you met with a lot of, you know, backlash and people trying to be like, no, you're delusional, basically. Mm -hmm. So we have had a lot of students who've been denying at, um, us and saying that we just um, we're just trying to create a racist storm and um, we're just angry black students who um, just want to make a scene and we don't know what we want. We're just people who just want to throw their toys out of their carts. Um, so yeah, but we have received um, a lot of support mm -hmm. at the same time. And from the students? From the students. We have received um, support, um, particularly with the occupation. Um, ever since the occupation started, we have gained a lot of support. You know, one of the things that um, is often overlooked mm -hmm. is that we, we live in, we work through human institutions. And human institutions are by definition imperfect institutions. Mm -hmm. Because they are imperfect institutions, it means they can always be improved. Mm -hmm. And the error some people make is to treat their institutions as if they were created by God. Yeah. And if they were created by God and they're perfect, then you can't change them. Mm -hmm. Now the fact of the matter is, what are these institutions? Well, it's not only that these institutions were created by colonialism, but these were institutions were also created by another assertion of colonialism, because we forget that apartheid was colonialism and then a reassertion of colonialism. Mm -hmm. So it's a double move. But the second thing is, you see, educational institutions have always imagined themselves as independent of the political and social situation. Now, logically, if they're independent of the political and social situation, mm -hmm. then it means that when you change to post-apartheid, they don't have to change because they were independent in the first place. The problem is that that, that doesn't bear out in history. They were completely endemic, they were completely indigenous to those kinds of institutions. Mm -hmm. And those institutions designed education systems that were to say certain people don't, didn't belong, in, not only didn't belong in them, were not educatable. So the very idea that you're gonna keep those structures and then take those people and put them in, in a system that in its logic is designed to say that they don't belong, Mm. Of course they're going to experience the alienation. Mm -hmm. it, the only way around it is not simply for those students, which they're doing, to point out that they're a relationship with an institution. And so one has to develop new kinds of ways of running the institution, which is exactly what these students are saying. But it means the institutions themselves are going to have to go through self-critique. They're mm -hmm. going to have to ask how can they become a genuinely post-apartheid set of institutions. Um, speaking of which, of the logic of institutions, I'd like to get from both of you um, how the university has responded by saying let's open up debates, even with the question of the name change. Um, the institution is not is, say, is not saying let's change the name, it's saying let's open up the debate about changing the name so we can hear everyone else. And this has been a narrative that's been going on throughout the year um, when the students were making their demands to the university. Um, so what do we make of that logic of, you know, silencing other voices, um, because that's the narrative in terms of shutting out um, the people who might say want their name to change yeah. for problematic reason of reasons, of course. Um, but that's the rationale of the institutions. How do, how does the movement respond to that? Um, I feel like the movement is very clear in that we want the name to change. Mm -hmm. um, the institution has been going around the issue and they are still having discussions, but I do not understand how we are still having discussions in South Africa about changing a colonial name. Like, I find that, like, very funny, because we shouldn't be discussing how to decolonize a place like 
in, like decolonized institution in South Africa. I feel like that shouldn't be the conversation that we, that we are having. We should be having a conversation on what the name should be now. And I understand them trying to, because at the, at the same time, um, we are an institution and there are many voices. And they, I understand the institution by trying to include those voices of those who may not want the name to change. And I get that, I understand. However, I feel like for, for students, it is unfair for students who feel that this name symbolizes a system that is very oppressive and them saying that they cannot breathe in this institution and then you wanting to include a person who's very uncomfortable here. I feel like, yes, we should have voices, but not all our voices. All our voices should not be equal because Yes, we should hear each other out, but if I'm oppressed and you're not oppressed, I feel like I should have the say. The, um, that very logic is connected to the fact that in the end, we're talking about what's called a liberal institution. Mm -hmm. And the thing one has to understand about liberalism is that liberalism uh, uh, refuses to recognize you except if you're an abstraction. Mm -hmm. And this is why liberalism has always been in conflict around issues of race. And because if you think about it, if, you're, if, 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 if the very idea is that you can only be seen as an individual, but the idea that your individuality means leaving your race, your gender, your sexuality, all of that behind, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a way, paradoxically, it's also saying it rejects your legitimacy as who you are. Mm -hmm. And that abstraction then comes in when it says every voice is, the problem is there are certain voices where the system is already on their side. So they don't need to bring those things in, you see? So tech, paradoxically, to tell the others to abstract their way for every voice already privileges a specific type of voice, and historically that's been a white voice. Mm -hmm. It means if you're going to respond to these issues, one has to deal with the fact that's very difficult for many people to understand because it demands couching it in moral language. Mm -hmm. But this is a political problem. Because you see, as a political problem, it means that the pr we're in a process of change. See, some people would like to have a marker. 1994 was change. No, 1994 was an announcement of change. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the change is this long, hard journey. Mm -hmm. And we could, it's not just about the name of roads. Let's face it, part of the national issue to face is what's in the logic of the name South Africa versus say a Zena. Mm -hmm. And if we go even further, I was having a conversation earlier, because as you know, I'm from Jamaica. And I, it struck me, there are certain things that, that are not in my consciousness, and, I, and it occurred to me why. When you say Jamaica, everybody when you say Jamaica, you think of a black country. Now the fact is, even the whites in Jamaica think of it as a black country, and their consciousness of themselves is not as white people, but as lighter skinned black people. Now the logic of when you think of yourself in terms of black is very different from when you think of yourself in terms of white. Because as black, you have to be connected to very different sets of social issues, mm -hmm. connections to everything from class, who's at the bottom, globally, what are the alliances, those things. If you think of yourself white, and historically in terms of white, there are certain conceptions in which you don't think you need to relate to those things. Mm -hmm. Because white can exist as if it's pure and independent of those mm -hmm. things. So that consciousness, is something that is very different. And this is an issue in which the students are a part of it, but all over the country, as we know, mm -hmm. people are trying to address this. And one thing I'd like to add, decolonization is only part, because decolonization is linked to a continued colonial relation. Okay. But uh, the vision beyond that okay, is I, I also want to bring up the question of um, gender um, within the movement. In, mm -hmm. your, uh, in your book, you, I think you addressed it really well. Um, in talking about their relations, interracial relations as well. Um, but I think because, and you make this very clear in the book in terms of how as black people already the humanity is stripped off. Um, so I just want to hear from you um, what, you know, gender, how, how we make sense of gender um, with the black body that whose humanity is already stripped off. One of the things I argue is that no human being walks around as exclusively a race, a gender, a class, etc. But that means we have to think differently of how to bring them together. So the very idea of, 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 of anything that excludes gender is already doing a form of damage to the humanity involved. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Now, one of the things that's very, very interesting is beyond uh, the semiological or logical ways of dealing with these things, there's a very straight, concrete history. I was in a meeting, for instance, in which some of the uh, organizers announced that one of the tenets of their positions is Pan-Africanism. Not a single person in the meeting knew that one of the co-organizers of the first Pan-African Congress was Anna Julia Cooper, a woman. Now this is very important in many ways because you see, gender is more than the question of whether you put a female into a role. Mm -hmm. Gender is understanding the relationships we have as human beings, mm -hmm. which may lead to an historical way of understanding how political relationships manifest themselves. For instance, if we retell the history of political activism in terms of gender, you will find women leaders left and right. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, we define leadership in masculine terms that renders those women invisible. Mm -hmm. and, and that crucial work of infrastructural development, that crucial work of knowing how to build communities, the crucial work of knowing how to build education ideas, those things are heavily engendered and one of the things we need when we do this critical work mm -hmm. is to find a way to bring them together mm -hmm. and to, to, to now shift into the relations of how different kinds of political actions can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the movement will call itself as very intersectional yes. as well. Um, yeah. So can you talk about how those dynamics are going to come into play within the movement? Um, as you said, um, BSM is, a very, uh, is an intersectional movement. So we understand that um, there isn't a separate struggle, so we include the struggle of black people, the struggle of women, the struggle of um, people who are excluded because of um, their background, so classes, people, uh -huh. yeah, and so queer people. Um, so we are in an intersectional movement, and we understand that we cannot just fight for the struggles of black people. That we need to include the struggles of women, because if we just leave that and um, we say um, achieve our goals and then now we left with a different struggle to face so it has to be um, a continuous thing that we do it at the same time and um, so we are an intersectional movement. Thank you. I, I put add something to that mm -hmm. which is I'm glad you formulated it this way because in many places I've visited a lot of people don't understand what intersectionality is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They think it's a formula to determine what identity. Oh. Mm -hmm. What Kim Crenshaw meant was she, her metaphor was imagine uh, a, a traffic intersection where there's a collision. Mm -hmm. And in that collision, you have to figure out, she was a tort lawyer, what harm is done? In a system that says you recognize only property can be harmed, you only look at the cause of mm -hmm. the damage. Okay. In a system where you say only white males can be harmed, as long as there's a white male in the car, then someone was harmed. It doesn't matter if they're black people, women, whatever. If in a society you say only whites, then if you look at there's a white female in there, and you build it up. Mm -hmm. And her point was eventually, if you have a society where you don't have them, then there are people being harmed, but that harm isn't being addressed. Mm -hmm. So the intersectionality is a way of trying to make people appear mm -hmm. so they're harmed. When they're harmed, mm -hmm. that can be addressed. Mm -hmm. And so I think the formulation you just gave, it, this is the first time I have to say that I've actually heard intersectionality formulated right since I've been in this country. Wow. wow. <laughs> um, okay, to wrap up the conversation, um, mm -hmm. I'd just like to hear from both of you in terms of the conversation about um, decolonization and transformation and how, you know, it seems to not be going anywhere because mm -hmm. of responses from um, several aspects. So really, is there any hope, just briefly, in terms of this conversation and are we really going somewhere? Is this back and forth with um, um, protest, disruption, making any progress? I'd like you to have the last word, so I'll speak first. Is okay. that okay? Yeah, that's okay. The answer is, one of the things to understand about political activity is that you never really know the outcome. So what is the victory in, in political activity? It's the commitment. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to remember, and this is something Fennan argued, is actually by standing up and asserting your dignity and fighting, you've already won. Mm -hmm. You see? Because you see the very fact that even if they push you back, that record of standing up means there's a different kind of struggle to be waged. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, you never know the outcome, but the fact is, 
there are many things happening across the world that are changing things in ways. Uh, this is not optimism or pessimism. Mm -hmm. See, the problem with optimism or pessimism is they both depend on forecast. Mm -hmm. And in other words, of knowing before you act. But politics is about producing through the action, mm -hmm. which means we have to take seriously the outcomes we don't necessarily know, but the commitments we have will set the conditions for those outcomes. Um, issues um, around transformation in this institution um, are very difficult because the institution does not want to change at all. So um, we are clear as BSM that Mzabalazo, we are Kuba. Mm -hmm. So um, we know our mandate and we will push and we will push and we will push. And um, I guess at this point, um, all we're trying to is to um, our resistance to this oppression that happens in this institution because as um, we were stated earlier that this institution is a very alienating place mm -hmm. uh, and it excludes a lot of people so um, we as an institution we as the BSM are pushing very hard for this institution to um, meet our demands and we have been engaging with them and we on we, 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 we are not letting them slide very easily. <laughs> How they are constantly um, annoyed with us, I feel. But we need, we, 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 yeah, we, we understand. They can't be comfortable. We look, we, we stressing them out. We want to stress them out so that um, things can change. Because um, change does not happen when you are comfortable. So um, that, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, guys, for coming thank you. here. Um, and to everyone who's watching, thank you for watching and I really do hope that we'll be following up with conversations about transformation as they happen here at Rhodes University, the university currently known as Rhodes, um, and whatever the movement will be up to, we'll be following up to see the kind of changes that the university will be making as well. Thank you for watching. Have a lovely week. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you for coming through. <laughs>